So, I want to start this lecture by giving you some biographical details about Dr. James Rachel. He's the original author of this textbook. His son, Stuart Rachel, who is also a philosophy professor, currently curates this and the other texts that we're using. So, Dr. Rachels was born in 1941, and he passed away in 2003. He was a professor of philosophy at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and his work centered around questions about ethics and morality. He published a quite large volume of research papers and books, and those books include, among others, Elements of Moral Philosophy, which he wrote in 1986, and which is a text for this class. He also wrote uh, The End of Life, Euthanasia and Morality, Created from Animals, The Moral Implications of Darwinism, Can Ethics Provide Answers, and Other Essays in Moral Philosophy, and others. So he has a large body of both books and of research papers. He was a well-respected person in the field. And I think it's important that when we look at the works of various theoreticians like Dr. Rachel's, we take a moment to understand who they were and where they came from, what their position in the discipline of philosophy is. So the first term, the first theory, the first idea that we want to get a hold of is really a claim about uh, what we discover empirically when we look at the practices of individuals with regard to various moral activities uh, across different cultures and across times. And that view I call descriptive moral relativism. And it holds that it's just a matter of empirical fact that there are deep and widespread moral disagreements about various activities across different societies. And these disagreements are much more significant than whatever agreements there may be. This is probably a sort of strong version of it. A weaker version of it would simply hold that there are different moral practices across different cultures and across different time periods with regard to the same actions. There are different moral codes, different moral practices with regard to the same particular actions. So we can sort of think about this as our sort of recognition that empirically speaking, there are cultures that think that some things are ugly and cultures that think that the same things are beautiful. There are cultures that uh, understand what up is relative to one convention and cultures that understand what up is relative to a different convention. There are cultures that understand that an action is right, and there are cultures that understand that that same action is wrong. And so there are these differences, oftentimes dramatic differences, with regard to the judgments that cultures make about all sorts of things. And Rachel's presents two different examples of what he calls descriptive cultural relativism in this chapter. And the first example that he gives us is to recount uh, a story about the Persian king Darius I. Now here's a picture of a portrayal of Darius. Uh, he lived roughly from 550 to 486 BCE. I got the picture off of Wikipedia. The uh, URL is below. And those of you who like the movie 300 or the graphic novel series associated with it, or you like Greek history, right? you'll recognize Darius as the Persian king who tried to conquer Greece. So we know about him. Now, the story that gets related by Rachel's is a story that we find in one of the first histories ever written by this guy here, Herodotus. And he lived from 484 to 425 BCE. And he's sort of recognized as one of the first, if not the first, uh, historian in Western culture. And I got this picture of him, a uh, statue of him that is off of Wikipedia as well, the URLs below. And the story that Herodotus relates to us has to do with Darius um, sort of recognizing or advocating tolerance of 
differing cultural practices within his own empire. So the story goes that Darius called the Greeks uh, before his throne, and he asked them what their funerary practices were, and the Greeks uh, would burn their dead in a funeral pyre. That was their practice. And then he asked them, uh, well, what would it take for you to uh, eat your dead, to consume the bodies of your dead? And Herodotus reports uh, to us that the Greeks were appalled, that they thought that was morally repulsive. The very idea of eating your dead was wrong. And he brought the um, Calatians, so the Calatai, uh, this is a group of people who live in the region that's Pakistan, India, associated with what's called the Indus River Valley. Uh, he brought them into the room as well, and he knew what their funerary practices were. Their funerary practices were, in fact, reportedly, eating the bodies of their dead. Now, Darius asked them about that, and then he asked them, hey, what would it take to get you to burn your dead instead of eating it? And purportedly, the Kalatai respond by saying, like, oh, that's morally offensive. Uh, that's just wrong, right? And Darius then draws this conclusion. Look, there are different practices that are strongly held by people with regard to uh, what to do with uh, the bodies of people who pass away, and we should be tolerant and respectful of these different views because they uh, exist within my same empire. Rachel's second example is to return to those indigenous people that were once called Eskimo, Eskimos that inhabit that circumpolar region that includes the parts of the USSR, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. And he talks about not just their um, practice of Infanticide, he also talks about their practice of elder sod, that is, of allowing old people to uh, die by just leaving them and moving on. Uh, talks about their practices of marriage, their codes about sexual relationships, and he notes that all of these practices differed pretty dramatically from the practices of the people in North America and Western Europe who uh, came into contact with these people, these indigenous inhabitants of that circumpolar region uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. And so uh, this is yet another example of widely differing moral codes. And in fact, uh, in the history of America, when the people from Western Europe came to America, one of the things that they were uh, sort of shocked and many, I guess, were morally appalled by was the fact that there were really different norms, different conventions about marriage, about sexual relationships before marriage and during marriage. And uh, in general, you know, the Europeans were uh, had much stricter moral regulations about that. Um, Though they did it a lot, Europeans considered it to be morally bad to engage in premarital sex, to engage in extramarital sex, whereas the indigenous people of the Americas oftentimes didn't have such strong prohibitions against those behaviors. So he points to these two examples as illustrations of descriptive cultural relativism or descriptive moral relativism. 